Dear guests, dear President Mizzou, dear Rector Dissertori, dear members of the Alice Roth family, dear Professor Vyazowski, and dear colleagues, I'm very honored to welcome all of you to the first of the Alice Roth lectures. This series of lectures is part of a two-week activity, the Go Math 2022, that the Department of Mathematics organized the second edition of an event starting in 2019, which is meant to celebrate the achievements of women in mathematics, to foster further their partic participation in academia, and to show to the younger generation, men and women, that the sky is no limit for women as well. We wanted to name this series of lectures after a notable woman mathematician related to Eteha. And there was no better choice to name, it after than, to name it after Alice Roth, the first woman who got a doctoral degree at ETH with a thesis in mathematics, and the first woman ever to get the, the ETH silver medal. There is no ETH gold medal. So this is the highest. Okay. Alice Roth family was very supportive of this idea, for which I thank them and we are very happy to welcome them to this event. I also thank the chairman, Robert Weissmantel, for his support and all the members of the Alice Roth Committee, Rima Laifari, Giovanni Felder, and Emanuel Kowalski, for their work and enthusiastic involvement in the project, as well as Monica Kriecher for her invaluable work behind the scenes. Due to the pandemic, we were forced to postpone several times this inaugural event. Now that we could feel more locally free, there is an even more serious drama affect affecting populations close to us. And that touches our esteemed guest, Marina Vyasovska, more than most of us. We are hence particularly grateful to her for having kept her commitment during this particularly trying time. Our gratitude and the importance of this event is made clear by the presence of ETH president and our rector, whom I thank heartfully for their presence. And with this, I leave the floor to the president of ETH, Professor Joel Mezzo. <clears throat> dear Alessandra, dear colleagues and guests, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you today for this premiere at ETH, the first lecture in honor of the ETH alumna and mathematician Alice Roth. Sorry, I say the Swiss way. I would like to take uh, also this opportunity to extend a special welcome to Alice Roth's uh, relatives here at ETH. In this gloomy times between pandemic and now the war in Ukraine, it seems especially important that we celebrate achievements of the human intellect and scientific ingenuity. I can only congratulate the Department of Mathematics and Alessandra also on the idea of an annual lecture in honor of the first female student to earn a doctorate in mathematics in the history of uh, this institution. Alice Roth was one of the very few female students when she started her studies at the Polytechnicum, how it was called, in 1925. Before that, she had taken her matura at the gymnasium department of the Höhere Dörterschule in Zurich. Let's keep in mind, grammar schools were only open to boys at that time. In 1929, Alice Roth graduated with a teaching diploma in mathematics and physics with top grades, pretty much the same diploma, by the way, with which a certain Albert Einstein had graduated from the poly three decades ago. A graduation was followed by a period during which she, was, she worked as a teacher at the same secondary school that she, had, she herself had attended a few years earlier. Fortunately, for posterity, it must be said, she then returned to ETH for her doctorate. 
Alice Roth's doctoral thesis on properties of appro approximations and radial limits of meromorphic and entire functions, submitted in 1938, was such, of such quality, that was mentioned by Alessandra, that she was awarded the ETH Silver Medal for outstanding doctorates. The first woman ever to get the Silver Medal from ETH. With such a starting position, one would probably think that the further career in science was already preordained. Instead, the mathematician with doctorate, owing to the social conventions at that time, took a different path and worked from 1940 until her retirement in 1971 as the main teacher of descriptive geometry, that was my favorite, mathematics and physics in a private high school in Bern. I think it would be interesting, Alessandra, if we find out how many of her students um, came to ETH later on. That would be an interesting study, because I'm sure she was a fantastic mentor. And by the way, on a small touch, uh, my mentor was a physics teacher who came from Hungary in, in 1956. So you see how the, the story goes. I don't need to explain the context. Common sense is inclined to conclude that her window of opportunity for serious scientific activity with her subject had long been closed. Even more so in mathematics, the young man's game. But Alice Roth once again proved common sense wrong, as she, after retirement, intensively engaged in her great passion for mathematics and entered into a very fruitful collaboration with the Canadian mathematician Paul Gauthier. Professor Gauthier finally invited her as a speaker to Montreal. At the age of 70, a very excited Alice Rode left for her first mathematical trip outside Switzerland. As it says in the beautiful article, Alice in Switzerland, the life and mathematics of Alice Roth. Unfortunately, not much time was granted her after retirement to continue research. Health problems troubled her, and in 77, Alice Roth passed away. And with her, the best known, unknown Swiss mathematician disappeared. What remains is an impressive body of thoughts in rational approximation and functional theory. Among them, the famous Swiss cheese, which still inspires mathematical discourse today. And for myself, coming from Gruyere, you understand it's a special. <laughs> One is attempted to ask where all her sharp thinking and creativity would have taken Alice Roth had she been able to devote a lifetime to her patient, mathematics and research. The Alice Roth lecture, which starts with two days event, creates an ideal setting to keep alive the intellectual legacy of a true role model and hopefully inspires many young female mathematicians. I'm therefore very pleased to welcome a representative of this new generation as today's guest speaker, Professor Marie, Marina Wiatzowska from our sister institution, EPFL, in Lausanne. I had the great pleasure to meet, actually twice, Marina um, in uh, Bern in 2020 and 2021 when she was awarded the National Lazis Prize. I met you twice because the ceremony was postponed for one year. Marina impressed the entire mathematics community a few years ago by solving a puzzle that mathematicians tried to solve for centuries. For the expert in this room, she found an original and amazingly simple way to calculate the densest sphere packing in the complex eighth and 24th dimensions. Is correct? Maybe not that, okay. What sounds like an abstract mathematical topic actually turns out to be of practical use. Research on sphere, sphere packing in high dimensional spaces, as a matter of fact, is relevant for analysis of crystal structures, this I know better, 
or in troubleshooting signal transmission of mobile phones, I know that as well, and space probes or internet connections. I'm very much looking forward to your lecture, Marina. But before that, we will watch a movie on Alice Roth. Thank you all again for being with us tonight. And uh, with that, I hand over to Alessandra, or we go directly to the movie. OK. OK, good. Thank you. Mathematics is an enormous field, and like any other mathematician, Alice Roth could only work in a small corner of it. But the work she did was remarkable and respected. If in those times she was able to achieve as much as she did, she must have been a truly exceptional woman. She was a very, very deep scientist, very profound and extremely careful doing research at, at really high level after retirement, this is really something exceptional. I mean, I don't know any other example. I got to know her because a colleague of mine asked me to referee the first paper that she wrote after retirement. My first impression, and, and that was reinforced uh, as I got to know her, was that she was a, a very intelligent person, very, very sharp. Nothing artificial, nothing at all artificial about her, very natural. Alice Roth was born on February 6, 1905 in Bern, the second of three children in the roth landolt family. The family moved when Alice was six, first to Zurich, then to Zollikon, above Lake Zurich. I think as she was lucky that she grew up in a family that supported her and her choices, and in a family that was relatively well off. She had access to the best schools and, and so, but you know, many other women had that, and yet she was able to make really something out of it. After attending primary school in Zollikon, Alice Roth traveled to Zurich every day to attend the higher girls' school there. At that time, girls were not permitted to attend a gymnasium. It was at secondary school that her interest in mathematics began. Even before she took her final exams, Alice Roth had decided she wanted to study mathematics. After spending a year at a domestic science school in Thun at her mother's insistence, Alice Roth studied mathematics at ETH Zurich from 1925 to 1929. She got a diploma, then she got a master's degree, then she went to teach for several years. But um, she realized that if she wanted to be taken really seriously, even as a teacher, she had to have a PhD. While working as a substitute teacher at the girls' school in Zurich and elsewhere, she was also working on her thesis, supervised by Professor George Polya. She submitted the thesis, entitled Properties of Approximations and Radial Limits of Meromorphic and Entire Functions, in 1938. Alice Holt was interested in these two subjects, complex numbers, and the relationship with complex numbers and plane geometry. So just as usual numbers correspond to points on the line, complex numbers correspond to points on the plane. Alice Roth was able to do something which almost nobody could do at all anything with before, and that was to work with areas that are unbounded, that go off to infinity, like a strip, an infinite strip. She studied on which sets certain functions, certain class of functions can be approximated by better functions. Actually, she found uh, an example of a set where uh, a function that is continuous, so there is some kind of properties, cannot be approximated by better functions. Alice Roth found this set on a disk from which an infinite number of holes are cut out. This would later become known as the Swiss cheese set. So she found a, what's known as a counterexample to, to some property. And uh, in some sense, it requires a special type of, of, of mathematical brain. Because it's not just that you know what, what you want to prove, 
uh, and then you find a way to prove it, uh, it's you suspect that something is not true, but then to be really, really sure that you cannot prove it, you have to find an example that shows that uh, some assumptions are true, but the conclusion you might want are not true. When a mathematician comes out who is non-conformist in this sense, proves that everybody was wrong uh, in their guess, that is very striking and very important. And uh, Alice Roth did this. In recognition of this breakthrough, Alice Roth received a doctoral title, the first woman to do so in the Department of Mathematics at ETH Zurich. And to honor her outstanding research, the rectorate awarded Alice Roth the ETH Silver Medal. Which is a medal that's only given to the very best PhD thesis in all fields uh, represented at ETH. And we learned that, in fact, she was the very first woman uh, to get it in any field of research at ETH. Following this academic success, Alice Roth returned to teaching. In 1940, she started working at Humboldtianum, a private school in Bern, where she would remain until her retirement. The high workload prevented her from continuing her research at this time. She was well liked by those she taught, her former pupils recall, giving her the affectionate nickname Rothkäppli. In her lectures, we began to understand that mathematical problems can be solved this way or that way but also in this or yet another manner. She continued to read, even though she wasn't doing research. She continued to read, and she continued to attend seminars at the ETH. This meant that Alice Roth was able to achieve the remarkable feat of returning to research after more than 30 years away. Almost immediately after retiring, she took up her work on the approximation of meromorphic functions once again. I mean, it's like, it's like an athlete. You know, an athlete uh, stop training for a while and then have to start from, from scratch. It's extremely, extremely difficult and it can be extremely frustrating. And she was determined she did it. I think that this is the most amazing thing about this woman. Alice Roth began to collaborate closely with Paul Gautier, who invited her to give a guest lecture in Montreal, the first and only time that she traveled abroad in her capacity as a mathematician. She kept researching as long as her health would allow. She completed her final work in the Inselspital Hospital in Bern, just before she died from cancer, on July 22, 1977. I'm very lucky to have, to have worked with, with Alice Roth. She's certainly one of the very best that I've worked with. She definitely can be a role model, and she should be a role model. I mean, you know, younger women should just look up to, 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 to her, to what she has done. We certainly hope this will encourage uh, as many of them as possible to, if they're interested in mathematics, to try to continue, and, and even when sometimes it seems uh, very hard, uh, that you can nevertheless do it. So let me thank, thank again Monica Kriechel and Michael Steiner, who I know is somewhere here, but I, I saw him with the mask, so I'm not sure I would recognize him now anymore, for, for, having the, for producing the video. Okay. So we now start the purely mathematical part of the, of the event, and we are very happy to have Professor Marina Wiesowska as a speaker in the first of the Alice Law Roth lectures. So Marina was born in Kiev, where she completed her, in 2010, her undergraduate education at the Institute of Mathematics of the National Academy of Science. Three years later, after a master in Kaiserslautern, she obtained her PhD from the University of Bonn. Then she held postdoctoral positions in Berlin, and she was a Minerva Distinguished Visitor at Princeton University. And since, she, since 2018, 
She's at a PFL where she's full professor and holds a chair in number theory. She's best known for her solution in dimension 8 and 24 of the sphere packing problem that she came up with in 2016. The proof of the three-dimensional version, also known as the Kepler conjecture, involved long computer calculations where Marina's proof is a masterpiece of ingenious ingenuity. As mentioned by Joel, the problem of packing spheres appears in crystallography, but also in the theory of information developed by Claude Shannon and in big data. So this is what brought Marina to the forefront of the mathematical scene. Although her already a few years later, in collaboration with Andre Bondarenko and Danilo uh, Rachenko, they proved a conjecture of Korevan and, and Meyers on the existence of small spherical designs in arbitrary dimensions. Bondarenko was awarded a Basil Popov Prize for, his, for their work. Instead, we had to wait a few years to see Marina getting her share of prizes, of which by now she has collected quite a long list. So in 2016, it was the Salem Prize, in 2019, the Clay Research Award and the Sastra Ramanujan Prize for her work on sphere packing and modular functions, in 2018, she was awarded the New Horizon Breakthrough Prize in Mathematics, and she was invited, an invited speaker at the ICM in Rio. In 2019, she got the Tsarov Prize in Mathematics and the Fermat Prize. In 2020, she obtained the EMS Prize and the National Axis Prize, where the two of you met. Then she was elected to the Academia uh, Academy Europea in 2021. Then last but not least, Marina has two children. I thought that she had two young children because I knew that her younger one was is two years old. But in fact, I found out today she has a 13-year-old one and a two-year-old one. As much as I believe that family is not at all an only woman issues, I know that many women are concerned about the balance within professional and personal life. Marina did all her career with children, and she's a perfect example that this can be achieved with results of outstanding quality. Marina, thank you. Uh, so I'm very happy to be uh, here, and so, okay, if I do this... So today I will uh, maybe before I start or start the mathematical part of my uh, talk, I would like to speak about uh, another uh, very important uh, question because uh, the, I'm happy to be here and celebrate the life and achievements of Alice Roth, who, as we have seen uh, <clears throat> in the movie, was a pioneer among female researchers here in Switzerland. And so, uh, actually, the idea of uh, this first lecture appeared a year ago, and then we, uh, it was postponed because of COVID, so we are right, waiting for this event. And I was waiting for this event as well, and uh, then somehow three weeks ago, my life changed forever in a very dramatic way I could have never, ever imagined. And maybe preparing for, for this lecture was really, really difficult for me. And so today, what I also would like, I'm happy to celebrate uh, the life and achievement of Alice Roth, but also there is another uh, female mathematician I would like to memorize today, and I hope you will join me. So today I would like to also dedicate my talk to Yulia Zdanowska, who is a 21-year-old mathematician and computer scientist. So she was... Uh, and her uh, life tragically ended on 8th of March in the city of Kharkiv uh, because she uh, have decided, uh, after the war started, she, she refused to leave Kharkiv. She decided to stay and defend the city. And unfortunately, she died as a result of a missile attack on, on the city. And so you see that uh, uh, right now, Ukrainians are really paying the highest price for our beliefs and for our freedom. And I'm very grateful to all the support we are getting here in Switzerland. And uh, I'm th grateful to Swiss people who stand with us at these really dark times. 
And uh, I believe that we will go through that and somehow rebuild the peace, rebuild our world and, uh, of course, the science and uh, the creative thought will play an important role, role in this. And so let me start my, the mathematical part of my talk. And so, uh, in the introduction, you have already heard uh, about some of my work, which is about maybe most famous part is the sphere packing. Uh, but uh, today I will not speak that much about sphere packing, and instead I will speak about uh, the Fourier analysis and how Fourier analysis leads to results in, uh, in sphere packing. So here we start from a different side. For also here... Uh, uh, in the introduction, you have heard about uh, a bit uh, si signal analysis and that uh, sphere packing and signal analysis are actually somehow two sides of the same coin. And so here I start with introducing this notion of, uh, Fourier, unique, of the Fourier uniqueness. And so suppose that we have a space of uh, functions in the Euclidean space, and if we want to think of this... Uh, a function as a signal, then we would like to decompose it into different frequencies. And this is what is done with the help of Fourier analysis. So here for people speaking mathematical language, so here we introduce the uh, Fourier, uh, give the definition of the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of function, it actually tells us what is the contribution for each frequency in the signal represented by function f. And so uh, one uh, definition which uh, is uh, quite well studied in uh, Fourier analysis is the uh, notion of Fourier uniqueness pairs. And it works in the following way. That suppose that we have two subsets in Euclidean space. And we know that our function itself vanishes on uh, the first of these two sets. And that the second, its Fourier transform, vanishes on the second of, of these sets. And if we know that uh, when the vanishing of these two restrictions implies the vanishing of the function itself, then we say that lambda and lambda tilde is the Fourier uniqueness pair. And so here the classical example of such a Fourier uniqueness pair is uh, the <coughs> these two sets where lambda is the set of integers and lambda tilde is the uh, all set of real numbers except for the interval minus uh, 1, 2. And so then, uh, if we know that some function vanishes at all integers and also vanishes at uh, outside of interval minus 1, half 2, uh, or in other words, if its uh, Fourier uh, transform is supported on this interval, then we know that the function also has to vanish. And so how we know it? Actually, we know this from the uh, classical vitaker shannon interpolation formula. And here, actually, we, we know even more. So if we know that our function is band-limited to this interval, in a sense that in, uh, if, if, if we have a signal and it's, uh, we don't, uh, and somehow uh, high frequencies do not contribute to this signal, uh, then what we know that we, then we can reconstruct our function from a discrete number of points of, of, of its values. And so this result is actually extremely important in the signal processing. Because uh, this is somehow if you have a signal which is uh, represented by a continuous function, so it's like infinite amount of information. But what we can do, we can sample this signal only in the integer points, and this way we get only the discrete amount of information, and then if our function decay, decays, then we can even throw away those very high values, and so we have represented by our continuous signal by a finite amount of data, which is useful. And what is also important is that this uh, formula it gives us a way to reconstruct function back in a rather effective way. And so... Uh, and this formula gives uh, also motivates the following definition. 
It's that we can have a pair, and of course we know we already know if we know that it's a Fourier uniqueness if vanishing on both sets implies the vanishing of function itself. But we would say that uh, this pair it's a Fourier interpolation pair if uh, vanishing on both sets. If, if, sorry, if, if uh, knowing the restriction of the function to the first set and the restriction of its Fourier transform to the second set will actually give us an effective, uh, will have an effective way to reconstruct function back from, from this data. And so, for example, the classical uh, Whittaker Shannon formula essentially it is a formula of this type, only somehow the second set here. It's not a discrete set, but it is actually this continuous set of uh, real numbers minus the, minus the interval. And so this is the uh, uh, idea we would like to entertain further. And so what we would like to do, we would like to find other examples of uh, uh, Fourier uniqueness pairs and of uh, Fourier interpolation pairs. And so here in this uh, slide, I will write what is, which kind of pro property is even better than Fourier interpolation. So it is, uh, we call it a free Fourier interpolation. And it means that we have two uh, sets, so that collecting uh, information from this set is somehow it's the minimal amount of information we need to reconstruct function f back. So it, uh, it means that first that uh, if we know the restriction of function to lambda and the restriction of its Fourier transform to lambda tilde, then we can reconstruct f back. But also we can actually think of any reasonable values of this, of f on the set lambda, and any reasonable values of f hat on the set lambda tilde. And then we will always find the function f inside of certain uh, space of functions we have pre-discussed such that uh, this function f will exactly fit this value. So this is kind of, we really can solve the uh, extrapolation problem. So we can not only reconstruct function from the uh, information we sampled, but we can pre-assign values and then to find a function which exactly satisfies them. And so here, another way to say it is that this uh, linear map would be an, uh, so this linear map would be an isom isomorphism and so we also have an effective way of finding inverse to this restriction map. And so all, all these uh, properties, they, for example, work for the uh, Shannon interpol interpolation formula, and this is one of the classical examples. And so for, uh, for a long time, what was not somehow, what was outside of... Uh, uh, so as you can uh, observe the, in the, uh, the classical example, it looks like the set la lambda is discrete, but the set lambda tilde is not discrete because it's just a real line without an interval. And the fact which was not studied for a very long time is that the question whether both of these sets, is it possible to have all these nice properties as Fourier uniqueness, Fourier interpolation, and Fourier, uh, 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 free Fourier interpolation, such that both sets lambda and lambda tilde are discrete. And so this is a resu uh, result we proved together with Danilo Ratchenko. And uh, to my knowledge, this was actually the first type of, the first kind of results of this type, is that we find an example of, uh, of uh, Fourier uniqueness uh, sets such that lambda and lambda tilde are discrete. And so this is how the sets have to look like. So you remember in the classical Shannon's formula, we have to uh, evaluate function at all integers. And what we uh, discovered with uh, Danilo is that if we take square roots of integers, then we can re replace this uh, non-discrete set lambda tilde by another discrete set, which actually will be symmetric to this one. So if we are considering a still discrete set, but now it's a discrete set, so they have different, when density of the set increases, because uh, if you think on in, of integers on the real line, then they are spread in the most uniform way you can think about over the real line. And what happens to this set is that it's rather sparse close to the origin, but as we are going to the infinity, the square roots of n, they become closer, closer, and closer to, to, to each other. So here we... Uh, and by uh, 
using this additional information, we can achieve a situation that this, this set lambda tilde, the set on, so to say, on the other side of Fourier transform, it can also be discrete. And so after uh, this uh, result uh, was published, you know, joking a little bit, but I guess, uh, so you also see that the quote is somehow maybe a feature of this, uh, uh, of our paper with Danilo is that uh, lambda and lambda tilde, they have this very, very rigid algebraic structure. And when analysts have seen uh, this uh, uh, paper, I guess they were a bit embarrassed and they had to find out, they see that, okay, so probably is this indeed uh, the important, uh, is it so important that these two sets have this very rigid algebraic structure or maybe this is just the somehow analytic phenomena and only the uh, density of points is important. And so here one of the interesting results was is a, uh, a result, I think not published yet, but announced by Sodin, Kulikov and Nazarov, who analyzed this Fourier uniqueness and non-uniqueness pairs from the analytic point of view, and they showed that actually this phenomena, it's not an uh, algebraic or not a number theoretic phenomena, and that it's indeed an, an analytic uh, question and that only analytic properties of the set lambda and lambda tilde are important and this particular algebraic structure is still very useful as I will tell you in the next slides because it gives uh, it allows us to construct very explicit interpolating bases but in principle only the density of these two sets is is really important and so also there have been very interesting results in uh, number theory. So Andriy Bandarenko, Daniela Rachenko and uh, Christian Seip, uh, they found another type of uh, Fourier interpolation formula here. And now it's not symmetric. It's very different. It's different. So on one side we have logarithms of integers and on another side we have uh, real parts of the uh, roots of zeta function. And so it turns out that these two uh, sets, they also form a Fourier uh, interpolation pair. And of course, this result, it is somehow, uh, so, so the result holds even without Riemann hypothesis, only somehow than the formulation, it would be not, the f uh, would be slightly different. But if Riemann hypothesis is true, then indeed lambda tilde would be a true uh, subset of real numbers. And so this somehow, on, on one hand, rather mysterious result, but as a number theorist, I think it's also very beautiful that yeah, this kind of strange analytic property is satisfied by the roots of uh, zeta function. And then, uh, <clears throat> again, there was like a, a other, so maybe two, uh, a other sequences of numbers were analyzed. So young uh, uh, mathematicians, so, Ramos and Susa, and I think Ramos, he was a, uh, he worked in ETH and maybe still still works. He's a postdoc fellow here. Uh, so they found uh, other examples of Fourier uniqueness pairs, if the, the uh, pairs of, of this form, and here alpha and beta are two integers, if, if, they, if these integers are uh, small enough so that both uh, sets are sufficiently dense, then we also have the Fourier uniqueness property. And uh, it's also possible, actually, Ram, uh, Ramos and Susa showed that if we perturb this, uh, this kind of uh, nodes a little bit, uh, then we still have a Fourier interpolation property. But here, but here in their result, really the uh, perturbation has to be small. And the farther we go from zero, then smaller it has to be. And then there is this what seems to be like much stronger result by Sodin, Kulikov, and Nazarov, who give a very some, uh, general result which says that somehow correct density applies Fourier interpolation, and they introduce this notion of supercritical and subcritical density. And then there are also actually other, other uh, results related to other interesting, uh, other interesting sets, lambda and lambda tilde. And so let me stop a little bit more on this notion of critical and subcritical density. So you remember in our example, we had uh, we, our sequence was square root of n, where n runs over the you know, positive integers. 
And so the, uh, this is the definition of Sodin, Kulikov, and Nazarov. So they allow this such an unsymmetric uh, pairs, lambda and lambda, til lambda tilde, and they can have different densities. So the uh, density of lambda is governed by this low, by, uh, roughly speaking, n to the mi uh, minus 1 over p, and the density of the second sequence is governed by this low n to the minus 1 over q, such that p and q are connected by this relation, rather famous in analysis, which also comes up in many places in analysis. And what they uh, show that if this, uh, this is, they say that the uh, pairs with this property are co uh, uh, called supercritical, and so pairs with this property are called subcritical. And what they uh, prove essentially is uh, supercriticality implies uniqueness and interpolation, and uh, subcriticality implies non uniqueness. So if density is big enough, then we have all these nice properties. If the density is not sufficient, then we cannot have them. And so let me stop a little bit at our uh, result with uh, Danilo to explain a bit more how, how it goes and also to say a few words about the proof. And so together with Danilo, we've proven the following uh, theorem. So we've proven that there exists a collection of Schwartz functions, and just to remind that Schwartz functions are functions on real line which uh, decay faster than any polynomial, which are infinitely smooth, so they have derivatives of all degrees, and all their uh, derivatives also decay faster than any inverse power of a polynomial. Uh, so this is a rather, uh, so I would say, in functional analysis is considered a rather small space of uh, fa functions, because this condition of being Schwarz function is rather exclusive. Uh, but what is nice about the space of Schwarz functions is that Fourier transform acts on it. If we take a signal which is represented by Schwarz function, we compute its Fourier transform, and we are getting Schwarz function back. And so together with Danilo, we have shown that we could have a collection of Schwarz functions, which we call, call an interpolating basis. And this interpolating basis has the following property. So if we take any Schwarz function p and any point on the real line, then we can reconstruct function p from its values at uh, square roots of, uh, like plus and minus square roots of integers, and it can be reconstructed with the help of the, of the following formula. So here are these uh, functions, they indeed play the role of the interpolating basis. And what is nice about this representation is the right-hand side of this formula will converge absolutely. So these sums, they are all somehow mathematically as honest as they can be. So. And so here is the plot of these functions. So you see that uh, yeah, somehow these functions, on one hand, they are nice and they are doing their job of, of being interpolating functions in the sense that if we, for example, take a first function here, then it will have B1, it will take value 1 at point 1, and then it will uh, take value 0 at all other square roots of integers. Uh, on the other, uh, so and its Fourier transform, it will actually vanish at all square roots of uh, integers. On the other hand, we also see that these functions, they behave, okay, so maybe uh, in, in this rather difficult way, so they are not... No, 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 not that simple. So they, they are supposed to play the same, so to be similar to this cardial sine and cardial cosine function, but since our, interpolate, our set of interpolation became more complicated, then we see that from our functions we are also getting this more complicated behavior. And so here what... Uh, what uh, I'd like to say that uh, for our uh, for this set, it's not exact, but it's essentially it's almost have this the nicest possible from the three properties I, I defined at the beginning. This set has the, the nicest or the strongest possible property. Uh, 
namely be, being the free uh, Fourier interpolation uh, pair, uh, with a small somehow defect. So here there is a finite dimensional defect to that property, and it's def uh, defined in the following way. So it's because if we, are, uh, we have a, a function, and we uh, com for function on real line, and we compute its values at all these uh, points I've just mentioned, and uh, the sa doing the same thing for its Fourier transform. So first, we will not really be able to reconstruct the function. Actually, so we will need uh, uh, another additional piece of information to do that. Namely, simply knowing the values of function and values of its Fourier transform at all uh, plus minus square roots of integers is not enough. We will also need to know its value at zero, uh, sorry, the value of its first derivative at zero and the first derivative of the Fourier transform at zero. And uh, uh, another, f there is a, also another problem. It's not the only problem. There is another problem. Another problem is that if you want to assign any kind of uh, values we want to this, to the derivative and to the values of function, we might not be able to do this because we have some linear relations. And these linear relations are given by the Poisson summation, po possible Poisson summation formulas. But luckily for us, there are only two linear relations like this. Only two conditions have to be respected, and uh, uh, then any, any set of uh, values can be represented by uh, values of uh, Schwarz function. And so, what are these relations? I will tell you in a moment. So, these relations are the following. So, first we have, uh, we know that this relation have to, has to be satisfied. So if, uh, and it comes from the Poisson summation formula for the lattice of integers. And also this more complicated relation has to be defined. And in, essentially it comes from the uh, Poisson summation formula in dimension three for the lattice, uh, for the cubic lattice z, z to the z cubed. Uh, but these are the only two abstractions, and otherwise, this like model of this kernel, the, the map which I defined, the map phi which I defined on the previous slide, it is actually an isomorphism. And so, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the proof because the proof it's actually rather simple. Uh, here, there is, there is a nice trick here on how to. Uh, find the proof of the interpolation formula. So first, it's maybe a bit of a technical uh, aspect is that we are going to work with uh, odd and even functions separately. So if we, are, we have a function on the real line, we have symmetry with when x goes to minus x, so this central symmetry around zero, and uh, far f uh, each function can be split into a sum of two. The first function is symmetric with respect to zero, and the function which is uh, anti-symmetric, so odd and even functions. And so let's, okay, let's look at the moment at the even part. So, so we have this interesting sequence of numbers, and, uh, and so this is what I teach my students in a discrete mathematics class. If you have an interesting sequence of numbers, or for the same reason, interesting sequence of functions, then you should always consider generating series. And if you cannot compute this now elements of the sequence itself, you yet might be able to compute the generating series. And so here I am going to use this meta principle. So let's write this generating function, which uh, account for all our uh, free interpolation uh, basis functions bn, so symmetrized around origin. And f tilde will contain the information about the Fourier transform of the elements in the interpolating basis. And so now, what we are going to do, uh, we will make the following trick. So this is somehow the, on the main trick in our proof is that what we are going to do now, we are going to consider this family of functions. So here we are looking at the x as a variable, so x is a variable in the real line. 
and tau it's a complex number such that the imaginary part of tau is positive and then this function it will be indeed a Schwarz function it will uh, be infinitely smooth and it will also have very fast decay as x goes to infinity or minus infinity and so now what we can do we can uh, apply our Interpola uh, sorry, uh, our interpolation formula to, uh, to, this, uh, to, the, to the Gaussian. And so then what we will see that interpolation formula applied to the Gaussian, actually it gives us, it can be written in this way by using the... Uh, generating series f and uh, f tilde. And of course all this works because uh, the Fourier transform acts on Gaussians in a particularly nice way. So if we are applying Fourier transform to this Gaussian, so then what we will get, we will get another Gaussian, only with exponent tau will be replaced by this exponent minus one over tau, and we will get an extra factor which is uh, written down here. And so uh, now this is the so now we can look at this for a moment. Forget about the interpolating formula and think about this as a functional equation relating these two functions. And now we look at the thing now. So at the beginning we thought of x as a variable and tau as a parameter, but now we are changing our point of view and we think of tau as variable and x as a parameter. And tau is a variable which lives at the uh, upper half plane of complex numbers. And so we have this equation, which I uh, rewrite here. Uh, but, oh, okay, I think there is a typo here, so this plus should be replaced by equality sign. But we also have somehow from the previous slide, we see that we secretly, we, we also have these two equations. So just because of the shape of our generating series, we know that this function f, it has to be periodic in variable tau with period two. And this function f tilde, it is also periodic and also in variable, uh, again in variable tau with period two. So this is what I describe in this equation correctly and in this equation with a, with a typo. And so, Okay, so maybe this this is not that uh, important. Okay, okay, I thought I changed this. Okay, so these are maybe some more technical details of the proof. So maybe one thing I want to say, I will not maybe ex read to you what was uh, what I written at this slide because this is another uh, kind of like technical thing I, w I want to do just to solve it. But maybe what I want to say is that. Um, these functional equations here. Uh, so now from what we can do, we can pass from this realm of uh, Fourier analysis into the realm of number theory and theory of automorphic forms. So this is somehow my, uh, what was my like mathematical home when I was doing my PhD. So when I was doing my PhD, I, I did not study Fourier analysis. I was really working on the theory of functions which have this nice transformation, prop functions of the upper half plane, which have this kind of very nice transformation properties. And fortunately, for already for many years, we have effective tools for solving this kind of uh, functional equations. So they were just uh, ready for, for, for me and for Danilo, sitting on the shelf. We could just take work done by other people, in, in particular done by Uslem, who is now here to, to have effective ways for solving such functional equations. And so at the next slide, so I, actually before coming here, I thought that I've deleted this page, but somehow Dropbox played a <laughs> bad joke on me, so. Uh, so these are technical, some technical details, which probably I will maybe leave it for the later. If you have interest, you can ask this uh, at the end. And so, yeah, so this is how it works. So here it's a bit sub summarized. So first, what we can do, so we can uh, uh, represent our function f. Here, it's, now we think of it as a function of tau, and we think of x 
as a parameter, and that's why we, I even don't write it here in the formula. And first, for a tau in a certain domain in the upper half plane, we can uh, define f as a certain type of contour integral, the one we have seen on a previous slide. And then what we have to do, we have to make a, an analytic continuation of f from this uh, subset of the upper half plane to the whole upper half plane. And finally, what is actually important for the Fourier analysis is that we need to uh, prove some bounds for on this kind of functions. So here we are again, now we are remembering, as we are talking about Fourier analysis, we are again remembering somehow uh, the vari variable x becomes important again. And so we have to differentiate with respect to variable x. And to see that this, all types of functions here, they have nice uh, growth at the upper half plane because this condition will be res uh, responsible for the uh, nice convergence properties of our interpolation formula. And so, uh, as I promised you, so this uh, particular algebraic structure of our interpolating set, it also allows us to obtain very explicit uh, representations for the basis functions. So we could have proven the existence of basis functions just by using methods of functional analysis, but those would be rather like an exi existence results. Uh, but here we can say more, or uh, we can also find integral representations for our basis functions, which will play important role in the applications, as I, I will show you later. So here, for example, we can show that our interpolating basis functions, they are given in such a way. So, so here we have certain integral along certain path from minus one to one in the upper half plane. And here we are integrating against these functions gn of z. And here gn of z, there are certain weakly holomorphic modular forms of level two and weight three halves. And here I use green color to underline these words because I will not explain you what this means, but somehow uh, those who, who are number theorists or those who studied already uh, theory of modular forms, they will understand this uh, secret language. And for the rest, you can just, I can just ensure you that these are rather explicit and also very nice functions. And we have a lot of control over their behavior in different aspects. And yeah. And so here is one uh, function which is actually even more explicit. So uh, uh, you remember that in our interpolating formula we had uh, functions bn, and we had also like zeros function. I gave it a different name. I named it c0. So this was the function which corresponded to the a derivative at point zero. And it turns out that this function is indeed a uh, different, and for example, for this function, we can have a truly explicit or even elementary representation. So we know that this function C0, at least if, if, uh, when we somehow it's uh, negative, uh, if we take, uh, yeah, like C, so this for function, which would be an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform with uh, a sine minus one, then it will be exactly this function. And it turns out that uh, it was proven by Romano John in uh, 1915 that this function is indeed an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform. And the proof of Romano John, it was pretty much this, this integral, it proves, uh, so this integral representation of, of the function proves this, the, the, this property, that it is an, indeed an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform. So I don't know, maybe, if, maybe we will find, at some point, we will find another lost notebook and, of Ramanujan, and there also find more information about other basis functions, interpolating basis functions. And so maybe you can tell me how much time I have left. <laughs> 15, okay, good. And so uh, then let me go to uh, closer to the applications. So it's uh, somehow for the applications, 
which were mentioned in the, in the introduction, application to the packing problem, and as I will explain later, also application to the uh, energy minimization problems. Somehow having this nice formula with single roots interpolation was not enough. What we really needed and how, how we came across to this subject was by proving this more uh, complicated interpolation formula. And so this uh, result it was proven uh, together with Danilo Radchenko, but uh, also in collaboration with uh, uh, Stephen Miller, Abinov, Kumar, and Henry Kohn. And what we shown that we can have a collection of, again, Schwartz functions. And uh, so here we did it, in, again, so because we're interested in dimensions 8 and 24, we proved everything not for uh, functions on the, on the line, but rather for functions on the d-dimensional Euclidean space, where dimension is either 8 or 24, and somehow, somehow our, uh, our story, is, in essence, is still one-dimensional because we are not looking at all uh, Schwartz functions, but we are looking only at the radial Schwartz functions. And radial, it means that our functions are stabilized by the rotation of the space around the origin, or in other words, the value of a function depends only on the length of the, of the vector. So it is somehow, it's, I write here, it's defined on the d-dimensional space, but in essence, this function is one-dimensional. And so what we have found for these uh, functions is that uh, to reconstruct their values, instead of taking uh, the values of f and uh, Fourier transform at square roots of all integers, what we can do, uh, we can take the values of uh, f at all square roots of even integers. And so we are getting, in some sense, twice less information. And we can compensate it by also computing the value of first derivative at all square roots of even integers and collecting same information for the Fourier transform of f. And then we will have these functions, so a n and b n, and b n are not the same as b n on the previous slide. So <laughs> these are new, new b n's. So such that each function can be reconstructed from this set of values with the help of this interpolating basis. And so uh, now how do we solve, uh, prove uh, this uh, interpolating formula? We are doing it in a similar way. Here again, we are considering generating functions. Only now functions have to be more complicated because we have this term which is, uh, corresponds to the values uh, of function and this term corresponds to the values of the derivative. And so say this is for the values of a uh, function and, the, and this is, and the f tilde is actually responsible for the Fourier side of things. And now if we are applying the interpolation formula to, again, to the complex Gaussian, uh, so here you remember that so now x it's not a real number anymore but it's a number in this d-dimensional Euclidean space and therefore I don't write just x squared but I write the length of x squared. And so now uh, the interpolation formula applied to this family of functions is equivalent to this functional equation for the functions f and f tilde. So this is now, this looks exactly the same as in our uh, uh, the first case of simple interpolating nodes, but now what has changed is the periodicity. It's first that we see that the functions f and f tilde, they are not periodic anymore, because we have this term which is not periodic. But instead it is, so to say, linearly periodic. So here this part is periodic, and this part here is also periodic, and this time actually with period one, so it seems like more restrictive condition, uh, but also we have here this part which is we are multiplying by tau, which gives us this not periodic but rather linear behavior. And so it means that now our function satisfies, satisfies these conditions. So we have this functional equation and this functional equation. They come from they um, express the fact that f and f tilde are. Uh, linearly periodic with period one, and this is the condition which we obtained from 
applying the interpolation formula to the, uh, Gauss, the complex Gaussians. And now, the, uh, again, the, if you esti the uh, effective estimates on f as a function of variable tau, they will give us the, somehow the convergence properties of our interpolation formula. And now at the time that I am left with, I would like to speak about applications. And so, because time, not much time is left, so I think I will maybe only speak about the first one, and maybe, maybe the other three, I will speak about them on some other occasion. And so now, how is all this related to sphere packing? And so the relation to sphere packing is this beautiful work of Henry Cohn and Noam Elkis. So this is the paper which they have written in 2003. And so essentially what they have done, they've applied the method of uh, linear, what is called in, uh, uh, linear programming to the sphere packing problem. And the method of linear programming, it was already ex used quite a lot in uh, discrete optimization problems, but it was mostly used in either in the finite settings, for example, for analyzing Hemming codes, or for in a compact setting for, for analyzing uh, points on a sphere and this kind of uh, also, also like, uh, like ways of p p p like putting as many points of a, on a sphere such that again distance between uh, any two of them should be uh, bigger than some given given number. And this was an example when this method is applied to Euclidean space. And so why this was more difficult, of, uh, this is because the Euclidean space is not compact, and so the Fourier analysis on, or harmonic analysis, which we call the Fourier analysis on, on Euclidean space, is also more complicated. But they found this very elegant formulation of the linear programming for Euclidean space. So what they proved is that, uh, so, so the, again, like the problem we are looking to is the, the pro problem of uh, sphere packing in d-dimensional space, and the, mm, some, the problem, of course, the name of the problem speaks of itself. So the problem is the following: we have our d-dimensional space, and we would like to put uh, as many uh, balls of uh, equal radius, for example, radius one, into this space. And as many, of course, we can say what is as many, we can put infinitely many balls into Euclidean space because the volume of space is infinite and the volume of each ball is finite and yeah, so there is an infinite possible number. And here, of course, we have to speak about density. So we are putting uh, our balls into Euclidean space and we imagine that uh, these balls are organized in some uh, reasonable matter. For example, the specking is periodic with some big period it's one way to pose this problem, or to think of uh, any, uh, another school of thought tells us that we could think of any kind of uh, configuration of non-overlapping unit balls in a Euclidean space, but then we just have to work harder and to define what the density is. But essentially it is the portion of our Euclidean space which will be covered by, by these unit balls. And of course, because balls, they are round, they have no corners, so we have no chance of filling all the space with the balls. There will be always some space left. And so, the, of course, the question is like, what is, what is the densest possible sphere packing in each given dimension? And so one method to uh, estimate this density from uh, uh, above, is the following. So suppose it's, it's to construct an auxiliary function. And what Conan and Elkis uh, proved that if you can construct a Schwartz function f, which satisfies these three conditions, the first, our function, it is non-positive uh, uh, outside of a ball of radius r0, where r0 is our fixed, fixed uh, number. And its Fourier transform of the same function f is uh, non-negative, everywhere, and moreover, two f f both functions are normalized such that the value of f at zero as the same as the number of Fourier transform is zero, at zero is one. And of course, you can see that uh, these two conditions, they actually, they kind of compete with each other. So this is some of different forms of uh, uh, 
And so uncertainty principle tells us that it's, it's difficult to satisfy this property that the function f is like, is uh, non-negative in a big portion of, of the space, but while its Fourier transform is positive everywhere. So there is a conflict between these two conditions. And so, but we should try to do somehow as good as we can and to uh, find this number R0 as small as we can. So here, of course, the proper, proper problematic for our part is to choose R0 as small as we can. And then when we find the function with these conditions, then we know that the sphere packing in the dimensional space cannot have density which is bigger than the volume of uh, d-dimensional ball of radius R0 divided by 2. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, Kohn and Elkis, they've applied computational approach to this uh, uh, problem. So in many in demand, uh, in a big list of dimensions, I think in initial paper they considered dimensions from uh, 1 to uh, 36. Uh, they just searched for the function which satisfies uh, these conditions uh, numerically. So they searched for function f in the form that it would be a, a Gaussian times polynomial, then its Fourier transform is again Gaussian times polynomial, and it's easy to control all of these three conditions. And so they were able to prove some uh, uh, bounds in all dimensions, but in most dimensions those bounds were not sharp. It was uh, some meaningful number, but it was not, uh, it was quite far away from the existing configurations. And in two dimensions, actually the result seemed extremely close to the truth. So what they found that in dimension eight, they found that every uh, sphere packing uh, can have density, uh, at most the density of the E8 lattice packing times this number, which is extremely close to 1. It's, of course, slightly bigger, but extremely close. And in dimension 24, they've seen that we, okay, they could not exclude the possibility that we cannot outperform another very nice packing, which is the Leach lattice packing in this dimension. But if they can outperform it, then it's only by this very, very small Number and again, like this, this small number, it was made. It, it was this number in 2003, but from 2003 to 2016, a lot of computations were uh, made on somehow with better algorithms and better computers, because somehow Moore law is still working and we are still getting better and better computer chips. <laughs> Uh, which allow us to make more and more sophisticated computations. And uh, at some point, the number of zeros here came to like 60 zeros, one, and then 60 zeros, and then something meaningful. So it was pretty clear that the, this, pro, uh, this method, it gives a complete solution of the sphere packing problem in dimensions 8 and 24. And the only problem was how to find this explicit for, function, because it was also clear that if we are looking at the function which looks like Gaussian times polynomial, we will never be able to uh, obtain optimal function, because polynomials have only finitely many roots, and uh, for the f what uh, was my result in 2016, that I was able actually to prove that there exists a radial Schwartz function which satisfies all these inequalities, and therefore it proves that, uh, sorry, uh, the E8 packing is the best possible packing in dimension 8. And same year is in collaboration with Henry Kohn, Abhinav Kumar, Stephen Miller and Daniel Ratchenko. We have done the same for the Leach lattice. And so here are, is the plot of the functions of this, which I, we call them, I think it was an idea of Steve Miller to call them magic functions. And uh, so even though I don't believe in magic in, in general, but this is a catch catchy name, so and it. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is how the function uh, which corresponds uh, for functions to function f, which proves optimality of E8 lattice looks like. So here I multiplied it by this big factor because it's a sh actually this function is a Schwarz function. It decays very fast. And at first I tried to plot the function f itself, but then it looked like small bump here and then just everything invisible, so I had to blow up it a little bit. 
And so I did same manipulations with its Fourier transform. And so from here, we can see several things. So first thing is that, so I, first is that this was supposed to be a function in eight-dimensional space, but I draw it uh, on this plot, and so that it looks as it is uh, just one-dimensional function, and that's because this function is actually a radial function. And from the conditions of kohn elkis theorem, it's easy to see that even if we have some uh, non-radial function, then we could have averaged it, uh, over all the rotations, and then we would get a radial function with the same properties. And of course, searching for radial function is much easier than because it's essentially a function of one variable, and finding function of one variable is easier than finding function of eight variables. But here, actually, like interesting remark that uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, uh, Martin Stoller, he has proven that. Uh, this uh, under certain technical conditions, this radial function is actually the unique function. So even if we allow for this function to vary with all the eight, uh, eight variables, we will not find anything very different from, from this function. So in a sense, this function is indeed unique. And so now there is another uh, observation which we can make from uh, this plot. It's that the, uh, uh, this function, it vanishes at all square roots of uh, even integers starting from 2. And same happens for the Fourier transform. Fourier transform also vanishes at all square roots of even integers starting from 2. And so this uh, actually has an explanation. Uh, this is an effect of the optimality, because if we imagine that we have a, a, an optimal function, this magic function which proves optimality, then it, it is forced to satisfy this condition. So in uh, linear programming and in optimization, this is known as a uh, uh, complementary slackness. So this is a jargon from a slightly different area. So this property that if we know that we, in linear programming, if we fi find a uh, certificate which proves opti optimality, then it has to satisfy many linear relations. And here these linear relations are exactly these ones. And so uh, from here, from these two re uh, uh, remarks, what we can see, we can see that our function, magic function, it is essentially, so here I have this equal sign with a dot, so this time this is not a typo, this is on purpose, because here there is also some uh, normalizing uh, constant which is missing, but up to this normalizing constant, our magic function, it has to be the same as the first element at the second order interpolating basis. And so, uh, in the uh, previous slide, I've shown you like how we construct the whole basis, but from this whole basis, if we're taking only the first function, then we can already solve the sphere packing problem. And if we take the all interpolating basis, then we can prove a result which is called the universal optimality of E8 lattice and Leach lattice. And it means that if we are taking, uh, if, uh, in for example, in eight-dimensional space, if we are taking points uh, of given, uh, set of points of given density, for example, density, volume density one, and we imagine that they are uh, interacting with each other with some repelling potential of certain, uh, it has to satisfy some technical condition, uh, but it has to be essentially like a Gaussian potential with any, uh, with any uh, pos possible real constant. Then the optimal configuration, it always will be the E8 lattice. So you are just, try, you are just trying to solve this kind of optimization problem, and what, it doesn't matter which potential we choose in this very big family of uh, reasonable potentials, the solution will always be the E8 lattice. So in this sense, the constructing E8 lattice is very simple. We're just throwing points in the space, make them interact with it, like repel each other, and then they will self-organize themselves into the E8 lattice. So even though it's somehow formally it does not follow from our result, but that's what somehow the expectation would be if this is the optimal configuration. Uh, so maybe uh, at this point probably I will stop. Okay. Thank and thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much. Are there questions or comments? There, there is a mic, yeah. You might have to press the button. One, two, three. Yes. Oh. Okay, sorry, it, it may be a stupid question, but I uh, was just wondering, are there negative results, uh, some discrete sets which are not uniqueness pairs? Uh, yes, so, uh, so again, like neg negative result for Fourier interpolation. Uh, yeah, so basically if we take this density to be less than what is, uh, so in, in a sense this result of, uh, maybe I, I come back to the beginning, like, uh, okay, where are we? Okay, so this uh, result of uh, Nazarov, it's essentially, so this like, uh, this is a, a, essentially a negative result. And then uh, Alexei Kulikov, I think he has even some more refined results about that if we assume that there is an interpolation property, then he can say like, certain things about the density of the set, even beyond this subcriticality, he has like, some more, uh, more re refined, refined results. I guess I missed this slide, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other? <coughs> Does this thing work? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so if you play this game in two dimensions of uniqueness and interpolation, but you think of lambda and lambda tilde as being one-dimensional sort of figures, you know. Mm -hmm. well, would you, you know, in, 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 in one dimension, you need things that get relatively dense, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you expect in two dimensions that you would have things which... Uh, yeah, so here I think it's like, okay, if we, yeah, so this is of course a huge field and I think it was partially, so there, are, there are results of this Fourier uniqueness pairs in uh, two, two dimensions and some questions can be answered but maybe not as much as we all would like to, so uh, I know that there are actually, I think the question is pretty, which is pretty well studied is what if one of our sets is like, an, for example, a like hyperbola and another set is also some kind of conic section, then and so there are like arts like this, but they are all not not easy, so to say. Section would work. Sorry. A hyperbola and a, and, and another conic section would work. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so here again, I think it's uh, you you have to. Yeah. So maybe maybe I don't don't know exactly the answer to your c uh, question, but I know that this question is uh, well, well quite, quite well. Uh, studied and because then the answer might depend on some particular parameters of that. So there also should be some kind of density density statement in here. So probably it would be like about like how close this conic section is to to zero or. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I I wanted to ask if uh, the knowledge about the optimal packing and the results about that can be applied uh, in to number of theoretic questions so uh, I'm sure they can but yeah but how can they be applied it's only like our imagination is the the limit and uh, of course I think this question of dense speaking it also or comes to so closely related to some other uh, questions and number theory such as, I don't know, for example, if you are looking at the number field and want to estimate how small its regulator can, can be, or similar questions. But then, of course, yeah, and another question would arise, so if you are using this result directly, how would it compete with other existing methods in number theory? So maybe the, my answer to the question would be, yes, it can be used, but then how exactly it can be used, that's, yeah, so it's, we have to try and to, to apply and to compete with other, other methods. Okay, so if there are no more questions, we thank Marina again. <laughs>